Hello everyone, we have an amazing live today with our research and development specialist on clean health, Stefan Yenef, and we're going to talk about how to burn a stubborn body fat. I think this is an interesting topic because there is a lot of nuance in this, so let's get him on and let's get into He's joining now. Remember to sign up for the giveaway we have in our feed, so stay tuned for that. Hi, Stefan, how are you? Hey, Astrid, good, how are you? I'm very excited to talk to you today. Yeah, likewise. This is a very inter interesting topic I was talking about. Mm. Like we're going to get into a quite a few interesting questions people sent um, yeah. about stubborn body fat. So the first question is about like people are saying not all body fat is equal so we could call them essential fat and non-essential body fat but beyond this is there any good of having a higher level of body fat um there's actually five different types of body fat so essential is the type of fat that is basically required for our survival so the fat around the in the brain and the, to cushion the organs so typically makes up about 3% in males and about 9 to 12% in females. So that's the fat that we really can't get rid of. And even if we could, it's not, we wouldn't want to because we'd be dead. So for the most part, when it comes to fat loss, we don't really pay much attention to essential fat. Um, outside of that, there's um, brown fat, there's visceral fat, there's subcutaneous fat, and then there's intramuscular fat. Now, each of these fats sort of plays a different role and function in the body. Um, so, for example, if we look at brown fat, or let's say we would look at regular white fat, regular white fat, probably the main uh, function of that is to provide energy to the body, also provide some cushioning to the organs. It's also a precursor for certain hormones because fat in itself is an endocrine organ or a gland. So fat cells, they secrete uh, certain hormones and cytokines. Now, on the other hand, if we then look at brown fat, so white fat is made pr primarily of triglycerides, so glycerol backbone attached to three fatty acids. Brown fat behaves completely different to white fat. Brown fat is made primarily of mitochondria. So what brown fat does is burns energy to create heat, and it burns specifically fat to create heat. Now, brown fat is typically found in babies, and until recently, we, we believe that brown fat was, wasn't really present in, in any large quantities in adults, but there's more recent research to suggest that it actually is around that shoulder blade and, and neck region. And some people genetically have more of this fat than others. And this is one of the reasons why some people genetically, they have more what we call inefficient metabolic types, because this brown fat basically decreases what's called mitochondrial coupling efficiency makes the mitochondria less efficient. That means the mitochondria extract less energy from the food that we eat and use more energy to create heat. So, okay. some, peop so some people who naturally tend to resist weight gain more and have an easier time losing weight, they generally tend to have a higher amount of brown fat naturally, so they tend to be less efficiently use their calories. So that okay. is one of the mechanisms genetically that separates people that tend to lose weight easier versus others that tend to have a harder time. But what we've also found recently is there's what's called beige adipocytes. And these are, these are fat cells that are like inactive beige uh, or brown fat. So they're kind of an intermediate fat cell. It has some mitochondria, like the, the brown fat, and it also has some triglycerides, like the white fat. And certain environmental conditions and, and supplements can actually activate these beige adipocytes and make them behave more like the brown fat. So, for example, we know exposure to cold increases those beige adipocytes and makes them behave more like the brown fat. We know certain stimulants like caffeine, green tea, that activates those beige adipocytes as well. And that's one of the mechanisms through which caffeine, for example, these stimulants increase energy expenditure. And there's other supplements like fish oil, for example, omega-3, that epigenetically upregulate these, these beige adip adipocytes. So there's ways now we know we can actually turn them on and we can make uh, someone's metabolism less efficient, which when we're talking about fat loss, inefficiency of the metabolism is a good thing. 
because when we have a very efficient metabolism, it means we extract more of the ATP from the food. Whereas if we have a less efficient metabolism, it means less of the ATP is extracted, more of it is used to create heat. You mentioned uh, that brown adipocytes are found in the scapula and around the neck. Would you say that the beige adipocytes would be located in another place? Do you have any idea of where it could be dislocated? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't. They are within like scattered around through white adipocytes. I don't know if they have regional uh, specificity like the brown fats do, but I suppose they would be. They would be around that area. You'd have some beige fat. So there's a great uh, amount of the, the brown fat there. I suppose there would be beige adipocytes in that region as well. Do you know what would be the reason perhaps that, that brown adipocytes are specifically located around those areas? Do you think, is there a particular reason why they're particularly located in those parts? I don't, I'm not sure about that, but I have reason to believe the reason some people have a higher amount of these uh, brown fat naturally and, and beige adipocytes is because depending on what part of the world you're from, what kind of climate you're genetically exposed to, some people need to have mitochondria that are more efficient at creating heat in order to warm themselves during the colder climate. Whereas other people who, you know, that have evolved from warmer climates, so a population that have evolved in warmer climates, for example, that's not import as important um, mechanisms for those type of populations. So for them, if you look at those populations, they genetically evolved on lower food intake and high amount of physical activity. So their mitochondria learn to extract more um, ATP from the, from the food, Whereas people that come from colder climates, like Eskimos, and need to be able to warm themselves, they, for them, that mechanism of creating heat may be an evolutionary mechanism to keep them warm during the colder climate. So I think for there is probably some evidence to suggest that. Okay, cool. Now, what's the difference? Um, oh, we already talked about that. So let's talk about fat burning process in a simple way. So what just, are these three steps that we want to understand? Sure. I'll, I'll just circle back there. There's also two, two of the other fats that we didn't mention. So we mentioned the brown fat. We mentioned the white fat. There's also visceral fat, which is the yeah. fat within the organs like the liver um, and surrounding the organs. Now, that visceral fat in particular is the most pro-inflammatory fat in the body. It's the one that's linked to insulin resistance and inflammation and so forth. And that's why if you look at this risk for certain diseases is – it's linked to central adiposity. In other words, how much fat we're storing around that trunk region. So white fat or subcutaneous fat, which is the fat found under the skin, can be relatively harmless. Whereas this fat found around the, the organs, that's the most uh, harmful fat. And fortunately, it's also the first, in, in a weight loss plan, it's also the first type of fat to go. That's why you might notice you have a client, a uh, very overweight client, You know, first couple of weeks, you put them on their nutrition and training plan. They drop, you know, a fair bit of weight on the scale. They drop inches. I've seen clients drop, you know, almost in the first three, four weeks, 10 kilograms or about 20, 25 pounds, drop four inches off their waistline and almost drop nothing um, from in terms of their skin folds because yeah. that initial fat loss is going to be, the initial weight loss is going to come from just inflammation, fluid retention, and just visceral fat, that, that fat around the organs. So that's another type of fat that, again, has a different function, behaves differently. And then there's the intramuscular fat, which is the fat that's found within the muscle. And depending on the population, that could be the good or bad. So, for example, if you look at your average sedentary person, intramuscular fat is also linked to insulin resistance and inflammation yeah. and, and, you know, cardiometabolic disorders. And reason for that is because when you have an overabundance of fat storage in your body, that fat starts to spill over into other tissues like the organs and muscles where it shouldn't be, okay? Yeah. Um, so that's why in this population, intramuscular fat, high amount of intramuscular fat is not good. However, then you look at athletes, especially endurance athletes that are quite lean, they also tend to have a high amount of intramuscular fat. And in this population, that is not associated with, you know, disease risk and inflammation, insulin resistance. It's because like in this, fuel. yes. So in this population, it's a more readily available source of fuel. So when they're performing endurance exercise, they can tap right in that fuel source locally into the muscle 
uh, to mobilize that. So that's the last type of fat, the intramuscular triglyceride. It's also sometimes you might see bodybuilders like before a competition, like the, the few days before, they might load fat in the belief that, you know, they're also going to reload the fat intramuscular triglycerides and that may contribute to like glycogen does to muscle volume. Yeah. But I've actually looked at the research on that and it's, it's so minimal, the amount of intramuscular mm. triglycerides that to me, I don't think a fat load really is worth, is worth doing it. You have a more chance of spilling over and gaining body fat than you do uh, replenishing these triglycerides. And even if you do, it's only such a minute amount that doesn't really matter that much. True. Now, when we talk about the, the fat burning process, there are three steps that are um, within that process. Do you want to talk a little bit about that to sort of yeah, create the base? Sure. So basically, in, in order for us to burn fat or let's say to lose body fat, what needs to happen is the first step is called lipolysis or mobilization. So we need to get that fat out of the cell, okay? Now, oftentimes, that's what we call the rate-limiting step because if we can't get the fat out of the cell, like if we can't get it out of the cell, we can't transport it to the area or tissue where it needs to be burnt. Yeah. Okay, so that's a critical step. Now, here's, imagine this. What happens if you're in a deficit and you can't get the fat out of the cell? Then what's the fate of, of, um, of that? You're probably not going to burn anything. Well, no, you probably will, but this is when you start becoming more catabolic in muscle tissue because you're still in yeah. a deficit. The body's looking for energy. It can't get that energy out of the cell, so if you can't pull the fat out of the cell, it starts basically catabolizing muscle and yes, organ sir. tissue and other tissues to, to get the energy that it needs, as well as obviously metabolism also gets ramped down and stuff like that. So that's why lipolysis is really important, getting that fat out of the cell. Now, once we've gotten that fat out of the cell, then that fatty acid, so a, a triglyceride liberates you know, the, the fatty acids and the glycerol backbone, that's liberated into the, to the bloodstream. And then that, those fatty acids need to be transported to the tissues that are going to use them as fuel. And that have, there's a protein called albumin, and the albumin is what transports those fatty acids to the tissue where it's going to be burnt. So that's the second step, transportation. And then the third step is oxidation. And that's when uh, that, the fatty acids are transported through the mitochondria into the cell that's, or tissue that's going to use them. So, for example, it could be a muscle cell or, you know, a liver cell. Heart, liver. Uh, anything. Basically, the only tissue that cannot use fatty acids for fuel is the brain. Um, but the brain can use ketone bodies, which is when fatty acids combust in the mitochondria and form ketone bodies. Ketone bodies can cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's an alternative fuel source. But for the most part, and this is what we call fatty acid oxidation, it's when we transport the fat to the tissue and then it gets burnt or used as fuel. And that process is regulated by that enzyme carnitine, palmitil transferase, which is a carnitine-dependent enzyme, which is where the popularity of that supplement L-carnitine you know, emerges from. And everyone's like, you've got to take carnitine to burn fat, bro. But oxidation is really like the last step in the process. And probably, like I said, if we can't really get the fat out of the cell, we're really not going to be able to burn that, that fat anyway. And the, the research on carnitine for the most part is quite underwhelming there is yeah. some yeah there's some studies that show it can work but you need to take it in high dose and you need to load it for like six months and you need to take it with insulin in order to load it into the cells and what that means theoretically like from a practical application standpoint you'd be best off taking carnitine during a bulking phase when you're eating a lot of calories your insulin load is high you're, you, you know, you're bulking for three to six months, you, you're saturating your carnitine stores. And then but when you transition to the fat loss phase, then you might more be more efficient at oxidizing fat, which is still beneficial. I mean, if we can, for a given deficit, if we're more efficient at oxidizing fat instead of carbohydrate, that may potentially spare lean muscle tissue because then we're not breaking down protein through gluconeogenesis to make glucose. So there's still some benefit to improving fatty acid oxidation, but it's not the main driver. We need to focus on be, lipolysis. Okay. What would be the hormones that are involved in this process? We talk about the, um, the hormones, hormone-sensitive lipos, uh, lipase, the LPL, 
the catecholamines, insulin, which ones of these are the most important in this process? Well, they're, they're all important. Um, basically, hormone-sensitive lipase is the enzyme that releases the fatty acids into the cell. So that's, that's the enzyme responsible for lipolysis. Whereas lipoprotein lipase or LPL, that's the enzyme that transports fatty acids into the cells. So LPL is a fat storage enzyme. Um, HSL is a fat mobilizing enzyme. Now, for the most part, the catecholamines, so adrenaline, noradrenaline, stimulate hormone-sensitive lipase to release fatty acids into the cell, whereas insulin inhibits hormone-sensitive lipase. So that's why insulin promotes fat storage. Insulin also block, insulin also activates LPL, so lipoprotein lipase, so insulin helps basically blocks lipolysis and increases fat storage. Insulin also blocks the carnitine enzyme, CPT1, so in, insulin also blocks fatty acid oxidation. So for those reasons, if we're looking at purely the acute response, that's why people say, you know, if your insulin's high, you can't burn fat. Uh, but the thing that's still most important is to burn fat, you just need to be in a deficit. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, and typically but, when you're in a deficit, your insulin levels aren't going to be elevated. For the mo or if they are, it's only acutely, but at some point in time, they're going to be low and you're still going to mobilize the fat because over the course of 24 hours, you're in a, you're in a deficit, right? That leads, that leads perfectly to the question of what would be the difference between actual fat loss and fat burning because it's not the same. Fat oxidation. So when people talk about fat burning, they're talking mostly about fat oxidation. Yeah. Fat oxidation means we're oxidizing fatty acids as fuel. Yeah. So both... Glucose can be oxidized um, in the mitochondria for fuel, so can fatty acids. Um, so fat oxidation means we're using fatty acids for fuel. Now, if we have high level fatty acid oxidation and we're in a deficit, that's a good thing because potentially, like I said, we're sparing uh, lean muscle tissue because we're relying less on glucose for fuel and then less on converting glu amino acids to make glucose. So potentially we might be sparing... Um, fat-free mass. However, we can be in a surplus e and eating a very high-fat diet and a very low-carbohydrate diet, but still eating in a surplus. And fatty acid oxidation is still going to be through the roof. It's going to be very high. But because there's a net surplus of energy and fats in the body, even though you're going to be burning fat at a high rate, you're also storing it at a very high rate. So the net effect is you still can gain body fat even though fatty acid oxidation is very high. So it doesn't necessarily mean if fat oxidation is high, that you're going to be burning body fat. Or at least it doesn't mean you're going to be losing body fat. You're going to be burning body fat, but you're also going to be storing it at a greater rate. So you still need that deficit needs to be there um, for the fat loss to occur. Now, when we think about bit, um, like these adre adrenergic receptors that we that they are in your fat tissue, these mm -hmm. are alpha and beta alpha receptors. What, what is the difference between these receptors and how can we understand them better within this process of fat burning? So when we look at the, the white fat mostly, and we, this is where these are not scientific terms, but we can subcategorize into two types, the regular and the stubborn fat, which is, I guess, the topic of this discussion. And the difference is, so basically... We have every tissue in the body has adrenergic receptors. So fatty acids have adrenergic receptors, the organs have them, uh, the blood vessels, the muscles, every cell has adrenergic receptors. They, and we have two, two subclasses of these adrenergic receptors. We have the alpha, which are generally inhibitory, and then we have beta, which is stimulatory. So for example, if you stimulate a beta receptor in the heart, you will increase heart rate. If you stimulate an alpha receptor in the heart, you will lower heart rate. And on, likewise, on a fatty acid, if you stimulate a beta receptor, so these receptors are stimulated by the catecholamine. So that's primarily adrenaline and noradrenaline. So the catecholamines will bind and stimulate these adrenergic receptors. And if the catecholamines stimulate a beta receptor in a fat cell, that will cause mobilization. That will stimulate HCL, and that will cause you to release the fatty acid into the cell. However, if the catecholamines stimulate an alpha receptor that will inhibit lipolysis that will stop you from releasing fatty acid into the cell so some areas of the body 
And particularly we're talking, you know, the research shows men around the midsection and umbilical, uh, sorry, midsection and uh, love handles, and then females around the thighs and hips tend to have a higher density of alpha to beta receptors, especially females around the thighs and hips. So there's some studies showing uh, alpha to beta adrenergic ratio of like 8 to 1, 9 to 1 uh, in the female's thighs and hips. And that's what makes it really hard. If you have a high amount of uh, alpha receptors there, when you have a release of uh, noradrenaline, you're actually in the, when you stimulate an alpha receptor, the alpha receptor through a negative feedback loop inhibits the release of further noradrenaline and we, and that that's how it blocks lipolysis so if you have an area that has a lot of these um you know high density of alpha receptors just a low grade adrenergic response is not going to cut it and yeah. typically what would I, what do i mean by low grade nor like adrenergic response is an increase in circulating noradrenaline so if we look at the two catechols, adrenaline and noradrenaline, noradrenaline is more increased in response to low-grade stress, whereas adrenaline is increased really in response to high-grade stress, or both noradrenaline and adrenaline together tend to be increased in response to high-grade stress. So just regular dieting and cardio, for example, will mostly increase noradrenaline. That's not enough to really inhibit uh, that alone will then if the cell the fatty acid has a high density of alpha receptors that will inhibit lipolysis in those cells and that's why i see with traditional methods a lot of women especially struggle losing that last bit of fat from their thighs so what we need to do is we need a strong enough adrenergic response to overcome that resistance of those uh, areas that have a high density of alpha receptors because if we have a strong enough adrenergic response we override the inhibitory effect of these alpha receptors. Like if you smash enough adrenaline, noradrenaline into the system, you will override that inhibitory effect because it will be coming in at a faster rate than it's being blocked. And then that adrenaline, noradrenaline will reach those site, the beta sites, which allow us then to mobilize the fat. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think there's a there's just wanted to do a little little bit of a follow up question. A lot of people confuse a stubborn fat with cellulite. Would that be the same, or do you think is a very big difference between these two terms? It's a completely big difference. I mean, cellulite is basically forms because of the fat pushing against connective tissue. So just dropping body fat period will help to some degree with cellulite. Um, but this is different. This is a fat that has a specific type of receptor, which makes it very hard to mobilize. That they're not they're not related. So what we need is we need to look at what if we're looking at how, how to mobilize the stubborn fat. We need to look at strategies to overcome this uh, inhibitory effect from the alpha receptor. So we need a high level to stimulate a high level of adrenaline or and noradrenaline to overcome that inhibitory effect, or we actually need an alpha antagonist, something that blocks the alpha receptor, inhibits it, stops it from working. So then the beta, you know, we can stimulate lipolysis in those areas. So, for example, um, the, the supplement Yohimbi, that's been shown to overcome this uh, alpha resistance, the resistance of those areas that have high density of alpha receptors. Initially, I thought... Yohimbi was actually an alpha antagonist that it blocks alpha receptors, but it's not. Yohimbi just creates a very strong, it's a very strong stimulant. It's a very strong stimulant and creates such a strong adrenergic response that it's able to overcome um, that resistance of the alpha receptors. Yeah. The, other the other thing is with, same thing with HIIT training. So if we look at, for example, low-grade, low-intensity, steady-state training, you're basically, because the intensity is low, you're only getting a low amount of noradrenaline response from that yeah. and yes look low intensity cardio see people get confused because yeah you burn more fatty acids as fuel during low intensity cardio but low intensity cardio itself is not very effective for mobilizing for actually mobilizing fat and remember fat uh, mobilization is the rate limiting step so if you have a lot of alpha receptors in a particular area um, steady state won't do much in the way of mobilizing it because you're only getting that low-grade noradrenaline response. Now, when you start raising the intensity, when you start performing like Metcon training or 
high-intensity interval training, something that jacks your heart rate through the roof, that will also jack your catechols through the roof. That will jack both your noradrenaline and adrenaline through the roof. And that may be enough to overcome that um, inhibitory effect of the alpha receptors because you're getting such a high dosage of noradrenaline, adrenaline, which in essence would be similar to what you're doing when you're taking a strong s- stimulant like, like the Ohimbi. So should one question. Uh, no, so go. should should be heat cut heat when you refer to heat is heat uh, as a resistance training as a cardio training or is it the same similar different what do you mean by heat? So in this particular case, we're talking about something that will create a very strong adrenergic response. So typically okay. something that will get your heart rate really high. We're talking about above. Uh, a workload that's above 80% of maximal heart rate. Okay. You know, something that, um, so that's why I said metabolic resistance training, for example, like circuits, GBC, uh, complexes, or you can just do HIIT training, you know, okay. interval training where you sprint for 15 seconds, you rest for 45 seconds, and then you go again. And that will jack up the catechols quite significantly. So you see that will or like I said, or taking a stimulant will override that inhibitory effect of the alpha receptors. However, the HIIT training, and you will dump, that will mobilize fat from those areas. You will dump a lot of fatty acids into the bloodstream following a bout of HIIT training. The problem is then HIIT training is not very effective for oxidizing fatty acids because the primary fuel source is glucose. So what will happen is, you'll dump all these fatty acids in the bloodstream, but most of the fuel that you use is going to be glucose. Now, after the bout, there's going to be a small amount of afterburn, which typically accounts for maybe 6 to 15% of whatever energy you burnt during that bout. So, yeah, in recovery, if you don't do anything, if you do a bout of hit and then you just leave it there, you'll probably burn another 30 to 60 calories or so in recovery, but that's not really a lot. So what would happen is most of those fatty acids that were liberated – and released into the bloodstream will just basically get re-esterified or reabsorbed into the fat cells. So this is why, this is how the hybrid method came about or was born, is where you do a bout of hit and you use that bout of hit to mobilize, to overcome the adrenergic or the, the resistance from those alpha cells. You mobilize fatty acids into the bloodstream. And then shortly after, about five minutes or so, when you allow that dump of fatty acids into the bloodstream, you perform a bout of steady state. Now that the fatty acids are present in the bloodstream, now we want steady state is more effective for oxidizing fatty acids. So this is where, in context now, fatty acid oxidation is important. You know what I mean? Because we have a whole bunch of fatty acids floating around the bloodstream. We've just mob- They're not fatty acids we took from the food. They're fatty acids we just mobilized from our cells. Now we want to basically oxidize those fatty acids before they get re-esterified. Can I ask two questions? Uh, sure. One of those is when people refer to perhaps like fasted cardio as a option to release more of these fatty acids and then sort of use them while they're in a fasted state, is that something that you think at some point, especially when we get these lean, very lean athletes that are ready pre, uh, pre-comp, uh, is it going to be any benefit from it, or do you think it is just like uh, something that it has been already debunked that is not necessarily effective at all? So I, I personally don't think there's a benefit to it, um, because and and here's here's why it's fasting in itself is not is not a stimulus enough to to cause a strong enough adrenergic response to block those alpha receptors. You know what I mean? Or to not to block, but to inhibit the inhibitory effect of those alpha receptors, to override that inhibitory effect. So it's not a strong enough stimulus. Now, what what actually has been shown to to completely block alpha receptors is fatty acids. So if if you take, they did a study where they gave a pharmaceutical alpha antagonist, so a drug that blocks these alpha receptors, and then they compared that to acute fat ingestion, so having a high-fat meal before a bout of cardio. And what they found was the, the fatty acids in the blood was able to completely block the alpha receptors. In other words, there was no net 
greater effect from having the alpha antagonist as well as the fatty acid. It was just as effective in and of itself. So fat in the blood has the ability to completely block alpha receptors. So that's an alpha antagonist. Yeah. So what would actually be better than um, a fasted cardio would actually be to have a, like a, a high fat meal. So you have fatty acids circulating the bloodstream because that will inhibit the alpha receptors. Then you can perform a bout of cardio. Problem with that though is you're going to have to do a shitload of cardio because you not only have to burn the fatty acid you just took in, you're going to have to also mobilize those fats and, and burn the, the fats you just mobilized plus the fats you ingested. So you need what, to do like a 42K You run probably need to do, your, yeah, you need a massive bout of cardio. But what you can do, we know if you go low carb for about four or five days, as the body shifts to using um, more fatty acids for fuel rather than glucose, now we have a much higher presence of fatty acids already floating around the bloodstream. These are just fatty acids that the body is using for fuel. And that presence of fatty acids already has an inhibitory effect. So this is why a lot of people, a lot of competitors especially, have known through you know, trial and error that when it comes to getting that last bit of body fat off, low-carb diet seems to be a bit more effective. Um, because okay. we're, nat we're naturally blocking those alpha receptors because we have a high amount of fatty acids circulating the bloodstream. And then at that point, it doesn't really matter whether we do it first thing in the morning or late in the day because we're still going to have fatty acids floating around and circulating the bloodstream. Okay, got it. So there will now, be... I, I have yeah. another question. Like, also, the other problem with the stubborn body fat is the actual circulation in those areas. So how can you improve the circulation of that body fat to allow for better bloodstream circulation in there? That's a great question. But the thing is the circulation is controlled by the alpha receptors. So those same receptors that control lipolysis, they also control blood flow. So if you stimulate alpha receptors, that, re that increases vasoconstriction, that reduces blood flow to that area. Yeah. So that's why you typically see areas that have a high... Uh, density of alpha receptors, like the women's hips and thighs, for example, tend to always be cold because they have poor blood flow to that area at rest. Unfortunately, those same areas tend to have be very sensitive to insulin. And after a meal, they tend to have very good blood flow after a meal, and they tend to be very good at delivering nutrients to that area, very hard getting it out of that area. But the same strategy would apply. The same strategy you use to overcome the the lipolysis issue will be the same strategy that will also overcome the blood flow issue. If we get a strong enough adrenergic response, we can overcome those alpha receptors. So that could mean either doing some hit and about a steady state, or it could mean taking some strong supplement like your Himbi, and then 45 minutes or so later, uh, then doing a, once we've jacked up the ketocols, then doing a bout of cardio. Or it could just mean low-carb diet, and just having the fatty acids in the blood, that will inhibit those receptors. In the case we don't have your heme bean in here in Australia, what could you, could you use instead? Yeah, I mean, your heme bean in Australia is a tricky one. Probably about half the time you'll get it through customs. The other half the time you won't. I think in Canberra you might be able to pick some up. Um, you could possibly devise a cocktail that is sufficiently strong to create that response. There are some fairly... Uh, strong supplements that you can, some fat burners that you can take, and they might achieve a similar response. But that's what your Himbi does, is your Himbi is just a very strong stimulant. Yeah. So like if you take a caffeine and green tea stack and there's a few other good good uh, thermogenic um, subs that will jack up, will create that r response, that could work as well. Okay. But and even, my other... Yeah, and my other follow-up question would be, uh, many people would ask you, if that is the case, can I spot reduce certain areas that are particularly stubborn body fat by doing a specific exercises or like pointing at uh, doing a specific resistance training targeting those areas? Yes and no, because... In essence, what you're doing is if you effectively block the alpha receptors or you, you know, override their inhibitory effect, you're able to mobilize more fat, particularly from those stubborn areas, relative to what you would had you just done a regular low-intensity bout of cardio. Mm -hmm. 
yep. which is why you find a lot of women, especially women on a high carb diet that perform a lot of steady state cardio, oftentimes they, they can get really lean in the upper body and struggle losing fat in the lower body. So by using a strategy to inhibit or override those alpha receptors, they potentially can now shift more fat from those stubborn areas. So if you look, that's in a way uh, spot reduction. Okay. Got it. So my last question for this live would be, what are the some of, uh, in addition to maybe using supplements, um, is there any, any other strategy nutrition wise that we could use to target stubborn body fat that such as, I don't know, uh, a part of, perhaps a specific calorie deficit or hydration, specific type of foods. Is anything, any evidence about yeah. these strategies? So, yeah, we already mentioned that. So you can either have an ingestion of a high-fat meal, like an hour or so before the cardio, let those fatty acids hit the bloodstream. They will then block the alpha receptors. And then you just, if you perform a bout of cardio in that condition, you will be able to mobilize more stubborn fat, even if it's a low-intensity cardio because you've inhibited those alpha receptors. The only thing is in that instance, as we said, you need to do quite a large bout of cardio so you tap into stored fat and burn up the fat you just ate. The other option would be uh, if you don't want to do massive bouts of cardio, you just go on a low-carb diet and then you already have just from mobilization fatty acids floating around the bloodstream just because your the body's shifted to using fat for fuel and that will already have that inhibitory effect in place. So even if you just do low-intensity steady state, you're already able to mobilize uh, those stubborn fats. And okay. this is why, I mean, if you're on a low-carb diet, you can get away with just doing low-intensity steady state, and it's probably better not to do high-intensity interval training anyway because your glycogen levels are quite low. It's probably going to be more catabolic. But if you're on a moderate or high-carb diet and you're not using something like your HIMBY or a strong stimulant, then you probably need to look at more like a high-intensity interval session as a means of then overriding the, the inhibitory effect of those alpha receptors. So there's several strategies that, or ways you can go about it, depending on your preference. Would you rather you know, ingest a high-fat meal than do a large, large, large bout of cardio? Would you rather go on a low-carb diet? Would you rather take a stimulant, like a strong stimulant, or would you rather do some HIIT training? So there's several different ways you can go about it. Can you use maybe, I don't know, saunas or... A massage or something like that to help um, or it doesn't actually work? I don't really see it helping to any great degree, like in that particular regard, because you look at mechanistically, if it was to help, how would, that, how would it achieve that? It wouldn't really block the alpha receptor and it wouldn't create a strong enough adrenergic response to overcome the, the resistance of the alpha receptors. So I don't really see that mechanistically how that would work. I mean, that, that's useful for other stuff, but in this particular context, I don't think so. Okay. Well, Stefan, so, thank you so much for no coming worries. on today. Great, My pleasure. Great session. Do you have any final tips for someone who is wanting to um, get into less stubborn body fat? Maybe go back, re-listen to this audio. And, you know, but at the end of the day, the, the most of it was just like going through physiology. The, the, the take home points was pretty, the practicals was pretty simple. You know, if you want to get rid of stubborn body fat, either do, you know, some high intensity cardio, followed up by steady state, go on a low carb diet, have a high fat meal pre training, and then go do a 90 minute, two hour cardio bout, or, um, you know, look at taking a supplement like your Himbi. I'd be, I'd be careful though with your Himbi. Just because some people have been known to get a like adverse response to it because it is very strong. Typically, the dosage that in studies they recommend is 0.2 grams per kilo. But to assess people's tolerance, I always start at about half of that, see how they feel, and then I go from there. If they tolerate okay, then you might you could titrate the dosage up to that 0.2 grams per kilo. And if and you want to couple that with a calorie deficit, of course. It has to be, yeah. Otherwise, you could be mobilized. Uh, like if you're not in a calorie deficit, you're going to be mobilizing stubborn fat and then re-esterifying stubborn fat or restoring yeah. it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's useless. Um, someone just asked a question about does warm water in lemon has or have any importance? In this particular context, no, it wouldn't. No. Just, so, just for hydration, I guess. Some flavor. Yeah. 
just in terms of the, the stubborn fat, mechanistically, it wouldn't. No. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for everything, Stefan. I will see you soon. No worries. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.